Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps. Here in the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, we're here to help you as a Gospel Doctrine teacher with your class. Today, we're looking at lesson number 19 of the Old Testament. And this lesson encompasses all of the book of Judges in the Old Testament. So Judges takes place right after Joshua. Joshua died in about 1427 BC. And then it goes all the way up to where Samuel was born, the prophet Samuel, which was about 1095 BC. Now, when you hear the word Judges, we think in our Western culture that Judges is about a judiciary branch where there's a trial or perhaps an appeal, and there's either a judge or a group of people called judges, maybe three or five or eight or nine, and these judges make decisions about things. And that's not really what judges were at the time of Israel. In the time of ancient Israel, these were more of leaders. And there's some uh, historians, some scholars that believe they're more like heroes uh, rather than they are leaders. Um, this also, the book of Judges, also has a continued cycle of um, apostasy and uh, returning to the Lord. So kind of like the pride cycle is in the Book of Mormon, this is a cycle of apostasy in the times of Israel. Now remember, Israel, we, the last lesson was about Joshua, how he uh, led the children of Israel into the Promised Land. Uh, they're in the land of Canaan. They do some... Um, they, they kill off a lot of people. And so that's kind of where we pick it up. There's been the death of Joshua. And uh, that's kind of where Judges picks it up. One of the overarching themes that you'll see throughout the book is that cycle of apostasy. So let me share with you just a few scriptures. If you want to talk about the cycle of apostasy in your lesson, there's at least these scriptures you should look at. Judges 2.11, Judges 3.7, Judges chapter 12, Judges 4.1, Judges 6.1, Judges 10.6, and Judges 13.1, if you kind of want to talk about the cycle of apostasy. Now, other than setting up the book and talking about that, um, there's three basic overall heroes or judges that are discussed in the book of Judges. The first one is Deborah, and we'll talk about Deborah in a moment. She's a prophetess. She's a leader of Israel. And then uh, the book of Judges talks about Gideon. Uh, that's probably the most famous because that's the one that's talked about most in the manual. Uh, and then last is Samson. Everybody, well, most people will remember the, the story of Samson and Delilah and Samson and his long hair. Um, we're not going to focus really on Samson. You can. Uh, I think that's a good story to show what not to do because he had several failures. Um, and so maybe we'll do another uh, episode where we talk about Samson. But today, we're just going to talk about Deborah quickly, and then we'll talk about Gideon. Remember, this is just a helps class. We'll give you some ideas, some additional quotes and references. This does not substitute the manual. Uh, you should definitely look at the manual, and then if you need some extra things, or you're looking to spice up your lesson a little bit, then you can come here and get some ideas. So this should definitely not supplant uh, the manual at all. All right, so if you've got your scriptures, let's pull them out uh, and let's turn to Judges. Judges starts um, on page 343 of the Old Testament. Um, and we're going to just pull out a few select verses, talk about them, and I'll give you some additional quotes. Um, so let's start with, if you want, start with uh, Judges chapter 2 and go to chapter 4. It says, an angel Lord came upon from Gilgal to Bacham and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and it brought you unto the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. This is a, these are good verses here to talk about the apostasy and to talk about different items of the gospel. So, for example, he says, you know, I'm the Lord, I'm the one who led you out of Egypt, and, hey, by the way, I will never break my covenant with you. 
This is a great opportunity to talk about uh, Doctrine and Covenants uh, section 130 where it talks about there's a law that was set forth from before the foundation of this world and that if to receive any blessing you've got to obey the law uh, by which it is predicated, right? So it's important to understand that once God says something it will not be thrown down and destroyed but it will endure. God is a God of truth. He cannot lie. And so if he makes a covenant, he will keep his covenant. God does not break his covenants. When he makes a promise, he'll keep his end of the bargain and he will not let you go unfulfilled. Uh, another scripture you can look at is uh, one in uh, Doctrine and Covenants uh, section one. I believe it's 30, but it could be 39. Hang on, let's take a look real quick. Uh, in your Doctrine and Covenants, oh, it's 138. Uh, everybody's heard this before. Would I, the Lord, have spoken? I have spoken. I excuse my, not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. Right? It will be fulfilled. Uh, other verses that talk about similar types of ideas, if you want to go down that road, are Alma 41.8, 2 Nephi 9.17, um, Alma 37, 16, and Isaiah 45, 23, and I'm sure there are several others. All right, the other thing I, could, I would bring out of these verses is, ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Well, what does league mean? It means setting up an alliance, right? You're not going to be pals with your enemies. That's basically what he's saying. And why is that? Why is it that um, you're not supposed to go in league or go in and become best friends with these people who uh, are the inhabitants of the land. Well, he goes on to say it's because they have these idols. They worship false gods. And remember, Exodus 20 has the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God, right? And he's a jealous God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? So, he doesn't want you worshiping false gods. He doesn't want you worshiping uh, Baal or any of the other ones. You're, there is no picture of Elton John, for example, that you should bow down and worship. You just shouldn't do it, or anybody else for that matter. No one deserves worship other than God. All right, so that's something you could talk about as well as you want. But verse 3 is interesting. He says, he says they shall be a snare unto you. Why is it? that these gods should be a snare unto the children of Israel. This would be a great discussion point. And you can bring up that, hey, we all have different weaknesses. We all have different trials. And how are those snares unto us? Why do we have weaknesses? Again, you can go to Ether 1227 to talk about how God can, uh, or why he gives us weaknesses, and it's to make us humble. One of the attributes of our deity, one of the attributes of God, is that he is humble. He is humble. Think about that. Think about how it is that our God is a humble God. How is it that Jesus Christ and God our Father, how is it that they're humble? How is it that they are patient? How is it that those attributes are in them? Because most of the time when we think about God, especially when you look in the Old Testament, you think of this big galactic ruler of the universe. And Although he is the galactic ruler of the universe, he's not so far distant that he's not involved in our individual lives and that he gives us these weaknesses, these trials, these challenges for our experience and that they can be for our good. And as uh, it says in Ether, if men have weaknesses, they will be humble and if they're humble, they will come unto me. Because that's the whole idea of the gospel, is to come unto Christ. To seek ye this Jesus of whom the prophets have testified. And coming unto him, he can fix the soul, he can fix your soul, and he can make those weak things strong unto you. Even Nephi, you know, he talked about, oh, what, what wretched man that I am, right? Talking about his weaknesses. And Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh. These are all ideas and concepts you can bring out in your gospel doctrine 
doctrine discussion. So if you want to bring up those, you can definitely talk about those. I'm going to skip now to uh, chapter 2 of Judges, verse 10. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. That's a great verse to talk about how time is going by here. Time's passing. The people of the old people who remember all this stuff, they've passed away. They've died. And so now you have this new generation. And they knew not the Lord. You can talk about what does it mean to know the Lord. If you want, you can reference uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, verse 1. You can talk about that. Go on to verse 11 of Judges, chapter 2. And it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and to serve Balaam. What does it mean to do evil in the sight of the Lord? This is a great time to bring up that verse where um, God says he can't look upon sin with the least degree of allowance, right? Uh, what does it mean to do evil in the sight of the Lord? How is it that we can prevent ourselves from doing evil? What does it mean that we have to do every day? Think about how vigilant we must be as uh, disciples of Christ in order to follow him. Our religion at least should be very personal and it should affect every facet and aspect of our life from whatever we do, from our relationships with our family members, from our relationships to our friends, the way we act at work, the way we act in school, the way we treat everyone that we come into contact with, right? You could bring up the Good Samaritan uh, parable right here where it talks about who is your neighbor and who was neighborly and how Christ said, go and do thou likewise, right? We need to be like Christ. Well, you could keep going on to verse 12 as all. Uh, it talks about followed after other gods. That's an interesting uh, phrase to say and how it provoked the Lord God to anger. Good, good verses to think, or good concepts to have good discussion points about uh, who are we supposed to follow. Obviously, we're supposed to be true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that in Nephi. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> what provoked the Lord God to anger? And, and obviously, what does it mean when God is angry with us? What happens? Uh, do bad things happen to us because God is angry with us? Or is it possible that those are just trials and tests of life? Great time to talk about Joseph Smith if you want. And he had many trials and challenges, and they're all set forth in Scripture. Well, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, right? The, the part in Liberty Jail uh, is in our Scriptures and talks about how, um, you know, he's, you know, why? Why do the saints have to suffer? Why do we have to go through this? And he said, the Lord God has suffered you know, beyond them all. Art thou greater than he? Well, of course not, right? And all these things shall give the experience, shall be for your good. Well, you can look at those other verses that you can talk about, verses 16 through 19 uh, and 20 through 23. That's in Judges chapter 2. All right, and then we're going to come to Deborah. All right, that's kind of more of an introduction type thing. Uh, but you could, of course, spend an entire lesson on just those verses. But if you're going to be talking about Deborah, I would look at, uh, you start in chapter 3 and uh, read verses 1 through 4. And 4 is kind of where I have underlined in some things here. I'm going to talk about uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and I'll jump over to 4. And then let's talk about that a little bit. Now these are nations which the Lord left to prove Israel. Okay? And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So there's a quote I have in here. There's a book that Neil A. Maxwell wrote. It's called, But for a Small Moment, page 103. He said, we need to seek to become like the Savior. This pattern was operative anciently as evidenced by the Lord allowing some of the heathen nations with their influence to remain in the land of Canaan as Israel's neighbor. Now, why would, think about that. We need to follow Savior and so we need to be tempted we need to be tried, perhaps even as Abraham of old, in order to see if we will do all things which the Lord our God shall command us, right? So this quote reminds us that, hey, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to have to have those trials and challenges. All right, going back over here to Deborah, that's chapter 4, start in verse 1, go to verse 4 or 5. I'm going to read 3 through 5 right now. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, uh, that's a good idea. You could just talk about that. What does it mean to cry unto the Lord? How is crying to the Lord different than merely saying a prayer, for example, or praying? 
Anyway, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Okay, so here we have Deborah, a prophetess. Now, in our church, we don't really talk about women being prophetesses much. Um, you know, there's that Eliza R. Snow figure in history that uh, she could probably definitely qualify in early church history about what she did. But if you want to go there, I don't, I never wanted to do controversial stuff in church. If people wanted to bring up controversial subjects or subjects that are kind of at the fringe of the gospel, I would let them do that and then I'd kind of bring it in back home because we don't want to talk about those things. You can, of course, talk about women and the priesthood and how those things are related and why women aren't ordained to the priesthood or if people have opinions of why they should be, perhaps let them voice those opinions. I wouldn't shun anyone or make anyone feel bad. Anytime there was some topic that was brought up that maybe made people feel uncomfortable, I would simply say, Thank you for sharing that, sister so-and-so, or thank you for sharing that, brother so-and-so. And then I'd move on to the different topic. You don't have to acknowledge it. You don't have to... Um, I would acknowledge the person, of course. You, you want to treat people with love and kindness. And just because somebody has a different idea about the gospel than you do doesn't mean that they're bad people. Doesn't mean that you should shun them any way. You shouldn't, because we should love everybody, uh, especially the saints, right? our fellow brothers and sisters in the gospel, we should love them and they should be precious to us. We should love them as Christ loves them, right? And in order to form Zion, we're gonna to have to love each other uh, a lot more than sometimes we do. But being respectful to someone and not saying, well, that, that opinion's dumb or that's stupid. I can't believe brother so-and-so said that. Well, pfft. you know, th that's not what we do. No, 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 that's not right. We treat them with love and kindness. And we could also say, if you want to acknowledge it, you can simply say, that's not something we're going to be able to discuss today, or that's not a subject that I feel appropriate at this time, or that's not where I'm going to take the lesson today. And so you don't have to bring those things up. But keep in mind that it's right here in our scriptures. It does talk about Deborah, the prophetess. And so women can be prophets. And if you want to go there, you can simply ask the question, what does it mean that Deborah was a prophetess? Let the discussion flow from there. Um, have there been other prophetesses? I'm going to give you some scriptures if you want to talk about that. Exodus 15, 20. 2 Kings 22, 14. Isaiah 18, 3. 2 Chronicles 34, 22. Nehemiah 6, 14. Um, <clears throat> can a woman be a prophet? So, here is uh, some early church references as well, and I'll go through these because it might be worth it. It might be something you want to talk about. So I'm going to go through these. All right, the first one is Journal Discourses, Volume 13, page 155. Next is Journal of Discourses 21, uh, pages 367 to 368. History of the Church, Volume 4, page 607. Uh, Wilford Woodruff's Journal, Volume 4, page 244, and Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 224 to 225. Those are the references. I'll take a peek at those right now. I've got my Journal of Discourses, Volume 13. This is a discourse that was given by Brigham Young in uh, General Conference in, uh, let's see here, i got to flip a couple pages to, to tell you. This is General Conference, delivered in the Tabernacle, um, November 14th, 1869, and he said, Learn to take proper care of your children. If any of them are sick, the cry now, instead of go and fetch the elders to lay hands on my child, is run for a doctor. Why do you not live so as to rebuke disease? It is your privilege to do so without sending for the elders. It is the privilege of a mother to have faith and to administer to her child. This she can do herself as well as sending for the elders to have the benefit of their faith. So they're Brigham Young talking about women administering to their own children in church history. Uh, the next one here is uh, Journal of Discourses, Volume 21. I'm on page 367. Uh, who's talking here? Let's take a look. These uh, Journal of Discourses are, are not currently church doctrine. 
although their addresses, for example, this one's given by President John Taylor, August 8th of 1880, Sunday morning, delivered at uh, Bear Lake. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is what he says. I was in Nauvoo at the time of the Relief Society was organized by the Prophet Joseph Smith, and I was present on the occasion. Some of the sisters have thought these sisters mentioned were in this ordination ordained to the priesthood. And for the information of all interested in the subject, I will say, it is not the calling of these sisters to hold the priesthood only in connection with their husbands, they being one with their husbands. I like what John Taylor says there, because the truth is, if you think about the biblical model, none of us, none, no man is, is good in a godly sense by himself, neither is woman by herself. It takes a man and a woman together, united as one in eternal marriage in order to become good or to become like God and have children and have offspring. That is the biblical model. That is what Adam and Eve did. That is what we are to do. And that's what John Taylor is teaching us here. Priesthood, well, you know, you can, you can just say, go to the temple, get a temple recommend, go there with your spouse, and you can learn more about those things there. Enough said, right? Um, but he referenced the Relief Society, and that, of course, is found in the history of the church. So I've got my uh, volume six here of history of the church, and this is what Joseph Smith said there. I'll just read this, page 607. This is April of 1842. I now turn the key in your behalf, in the name of the Lord, and this society shall rejoice, and knowledge and intelligence shall flow down from this time henceforth. Think about that. Knowledge and intelligence to the society. He's talking about the Relief Society, to the women specifically. Knowledge and intelligence. You can talk about what those things mean. Well, here is uh, volume four of the Wilford Woodruff Journal. And uh, this has some interesting things. Wilford Woodruff, uh, interesting man, prophet. Uh, profound insights. Um, all I can say is I am so grateful, and we all ought to be grateful for Wilford Woodruff, because what he did for all of us members is huge. He wrote down daily for years some discourses of the prophet Joseph Smith we have only because Wilford Woodruff took notes. He was the only note taker in several of the accounts. So if it wasn't for Wilford Woodruff, those would have been lost to history forever. So thank you, Wilford Woodruff. All right, this is uh, quite some time after um, Joseph Smith. This is February of 1854. And he talks about um, this, I'll just read it. This is page 244. He says, I called my family together for the purpose of prayer and dedicating my, my son unto the Lord. His father and mother laid hands upon his head and dedicated him unto the Lord. The following is a copy of the blessing bestowed upon his head. And then he gives the copy of his blessing. Why do I bring that up? Well, obviously it was his father and mother put hands on his head. That's not a practice we do now, but that was something that was done in the early 1850s. And then of course, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, this is something you've all probably read before. Um, page 224 to 225, he says, respecting females, administering for the sick, the healing of the sick. He further remarked, there could be no evil in it. If God gave his sanction by healing, that there could be no more sin in any female laying hands on and praying for the sick than in wetting the face with water. It is no sin for anybody to administer that has faith, or if the sick have faith to be healed by their administration. That's Joseph Smith. Now, why is he, what is he talking about? Does he say here that women hold priesthood? No, he doesn't. Does he say that they're ordained to the priesthood? No, he doesn't. He said that women can administer to the sick by faith. Anyone who has faith can minister and administer to somebody else because by faith we are healed. It is through faith that we are healed. It is through faith that God works his mighty, mighty works and his wonders. And the world itself was framed by faith. You can read about that in the lectures on faith. Well, moving on. Um, that's more than enough to talk about uh, being a prophetess. Um, if you want, you can also bring up uh, Judges 5, verse 31, um, because when she's done with her work, oh, it talks about wise ladies in verse 29. But at the very end of uh, verse 30, chapter 5, verse 31, it says, And the land had rest 
for 40 years. Deborah, Deborah went to war, went to battle for Israel, and they did what she said, and there was rest for 40 years. You could talk about what does rest mean and why 40 years. And you can even do a search to see how many times 40 years shows up for 40, 40 days. 40 is a symbol, something to be looked at. Uh, and then we look at uh, chapter 6, verse 1. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord de delivered them into the hands hand of Midian seven years. You, so the Lord was involved behind the scenes in getting these uh, thorns in their sides, so to speak. But they did evil on the side of the Lord. It's like they got saved and then they went back to their foolish ways. And maybe you can talk about discussions in your own life if you want to. Or have the class offer, offer experiences in their own lives. When they've had issues or struggles because they've been rebellious. And how coming back to God. Coming back to His commandments has, has saved them. Um, okay, you can also read verse uh, chapter 5, 7 through 10 is great. Again, reference DNC 130, 20, and 21. That's the, what we've talked about before, where there's that uh, commandments were set forth from before, the laws from before the foundation of this world. All right, and then I would look at um, verses uh, 11 through, uh, probably 11 through 20 of uh, chapter 6. And Judges, now we're getting to Gideon. So now we're going to talk about Gideon for a few minutes. If you want to talk about Gideon, this is where we're at. I'm going to start on Judges 6. I'm going to start on verse 12. I'm going to go to 17. We're going to talk about these verses and, and go through Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why, why then? Is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our father told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. You see, these are great verses because Gideon, the least in his father's house, poor, right, in Manasseh, and yet the Lord has spoken to him. Now, now, there's all sorts of things we can pull out here. What does it mean to be a mighty man of valor, right? How can we be a people of valor? What is valor? Great things to talk about. Um, at the end, he says, show me a sign, right? We are taught typically that it's not a good thing to be a sign seeker. Matter of fact, I would reference DNC 63 verses 9 through 11 to talk about that. That's a great discussion point. But I think what Gideon's doing here is he's not... Because sometimes the Lord speaks in our mind. Words come into our mind. And sometimes we can think to ourselves, am I talking to myself or is this God? Was it my own idea or was it the Spirit speaking to me? Well, sometimes you need to take those things that are spiritual and bring them into the physical world. And that's what he's trying to do. So, for example, look at what he did. Gideon went in, made ready a kid. This is uh, verse 19. And the angel said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there arose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So there you got a sign, right? Fire rose up. Well, and there's other ones too, right? Read verse 25. It came to pass the same night. Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years. Throw down the altar of Baal, and thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is in it, that is by it, and build up an altar unto the Lord unto the top of this rock in the word place. Take down the second bullock. Offer a burnt sacrifice. Now that's interesting. Why is it that we have to sacrifice? You can talk about the law of sacrifice right here and how sacrifice brings blessings and how ultimately we have to sacrifice all things for God. You could talk about that. 
Um, what is groves? You can talk about what groves are. Groves anciently are uh, usually fertility rites. They involved uh, sexual cults, things like that. If you want to talk about groves, great thing, great topic to research. I'm not going to go there, but you can do that if you want. Um, jumping over to verse 36 in chapter 6, Gideon said to the Lord, If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all of the earth besides, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. So here's yet another, this is basically the third sign that he's asking for. Um, this is something that's very interesting because it's a very simple thing. I'm going to put down some fleece on the ground overnight, and when I get up in the morning, if the fleece has dew on it, I'm going to know that I'm supposed to do this, and if there's no dew around it, then there's not, and, and that will be a sign. But if there is dew around it, then I'll know that I'm not supposed to, right? Trying to take something from the spiritual world, bring it into the physical world. Verse um, 38, um, Judges chapter 6 says, and it was so, and he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together and wring the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto the Lord, Let not thine anger be hot against me. I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon the ground. Let there be dew. So again, send me another sign. Do the same. Just do the opposite, right? Just do the opposite. <clears throat> Verse 40, And God did. So that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. You can also reference other times where God has done this type of thing. First Kings uh, chapter 19, 11 through 14, if you want to uh, go to that point. I want to share with you my thoughts that I've wrote, written down in my scriptures about this. This is perfectly ordinary objects. Sheepskin, ground, morning dew. They get arranged in such a way which allows Gideon to confirm the accuracy of his understanding of God's communication with him. This is not emotion or feelings, rather it is drawing God's communications into the physical world and seeing him speaking there. These were physical events observable by anyone present. They were outward events used to confirm the inner voice spoken to him from God. That intelligence to the mind was God. There's other times in scripture where these things, type of things have happened, similar things. Nebuchadnezzar heard God speak in a dream, that's in Daniel 2. Joseph in Egypt heard God in a dream, Genesis 41. Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, had dreams, Matthew chapter 2. Casting lots, uh, Acts 1, 26, Jonah 1, 7, 1 Nephi 3 and 4, and Matthew 27, 35, and then there's others, right? And even today, we can take ordinary things, and we can see them as signs from God talking to us, confirming God's communication to us. All right, Judges chapter 7. This is where um, one of the best stories is. Um, I love this story. I think it's great. And I think if you ponder this story and you think about it, it can have some very deep meaning for you. All right, the first thing you need to know is there's... Um, there's going to be this war. Gideon's going to, there's battle. Gideon's going to uh, be the leader of the Israelites, okay? He needs to get some people together. <clears throat> so Gideon rose up early. We can talk about what it means to rise up early, why we ought to perhaps rise up early. Verse 2, chapter 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Okay? There's too many people. There's 33,000 people. There's too many. <laughs> you're going to think it's because you're so mighty and powerful. You're going to take pride. Okay, don't, don't, we don't want you to be prideful. Verse 3, now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the mount. And there returned to the people 22,000 and there remained 10,000. Okay, got that? First cut, the first division. If you're fearful and afraid, go home. We love you. Thank you for coming. You participated. Hasta la vista, right? There we go. Fearful and afraid. So that's the first cut. The second cut, here we go. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water. I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, 
the same shall not go. Verse 5. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that bowed down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. All right, think about that for a minute. We've got a river. We've got uh, people who are going to come down. Got um, right. Uh, there were uh, twenty, twenty-two thousand. The fear and go home. And now we're going to take these people down. And out of that group of people, only three hundred. What they did is they, they, they. There were those who went down and literally like dogs at the at the water. And that's how they drank. There were others who put their hand down, and they used their other hand in a cup shape, keeping themselves up and vigilant. Right, because they put one hand down to brace themselves, and they put the other hand in a cup shape, so they drank like that. Right, with think about that for just a moment. Because they were vigilant. What does it mean to be vigilant, and why is it that they had to put one hand down and use the other hand uh, to bring the water to their mouth in a cup shape? Why is that important? Um, they weren't. The Lord was doing something to. Divide the people up, right? We've got three divisions. There's uh, three kingdoms of glory. Three stages of progression, maybe, that they had to go through. And there was only 300 left. And of those 300, those were the ones who saved Israel. And you can read um, verses 9 all the way to the end of 25. And it talks about, and you can talk about each verse as you go. Have your class members read verse by verse. And you can discuss how it is this great strategy of confusing the Midianites, they had their swords against each other, and ultimately how Gideon saved Israel. And there's, you know, other verses as well, but we've gone well over time. I think this is fantastic to think about. I think um, how we can apply these lessons to ourselves is vital because, as we've said before, we need to liken the scriptures unto ourselves. We need to understand these stories, and we need to understand how we can incorporate the lessons into our lives. If you think about everything about the lessons in the Bible, especially if you're talking about Samson, right? You could reference uh, Deborah and Samson or Gideon and Samson if you want. But those are lessons of not just Gideon, for example, of things that we should do. Listen to God. Follow him. Take these normal events as signs of God speaking to you. Let him speak to you. Follow what he says. Keep the commandments, right? Don't worship idols. Those are all lessons we can learn. Gideon's an example of what to do, right? Samson's more of a, an object lesson of what not to do. And in our lives, our lives, as we write our journals, as we live our lives, as people look back upon us, our descendants and others who study us, will our life be an example of what to do? And one of those good examples? Or will our life be one of tragedy and failure where they look at it and say, don't be like Samson. You know, our lives, even, even if we've had trials and, tr trials and struggles, we have all suffered. There isn't anyone who comes to this earth who does not struggle with different aspects of life. We all have weaknesses. Just because you've had a bad past, just because you've made mistakes, just because you've failed in aspects, does not mean you cannot change this very moment that you cannot kneel down in prayer and come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. There's nothing that says that you can't, from this moment forward, obey God and keep His commandments and rededicate yourself in this very moment to becoming like Christ. It is not easy. It is not easy. But it is a lifelong pursuit that you ought to engage in, and I as well. Because by following Christ, we can be saved. Well, I hope you have found uh, these materials interesting and beneficial to you in your study of Judges and in teaching your Gospel Doctrine class. We will see you in the next episode. Thank you for watching.